You know, as, as I was saying, and we're in this season here uh, of kind of transition. So, you know, our year has ebbs and flows, ups and downs, uh, fast pace, busy pace, and then sometimes, hopefully over the summer, you've been able to catch some R&R, &R, enjoy a little bit of time. Any of you do any kind of vacationing this summer? Oh, I, I know some of you were, uh, were gone. Maybe all the vacationers are still traveling right now. Uh, but as we go through the summer and we start to go back into this window, there are kind of natural places in our lives in the calendar year where we, we kind of kickstart things. Uh, January would be one of them, uh, and then the back-to-school season is, is kind of another one. So over the summer, we kind of get in those summer days, D-A-Z-E, we, we kind of just get that fog or we check out a little bit, and then somewhere our calendar uh, begins to force us back into routine and force us back into pattern. And so we're kind of in that window right now where we're making that transition back into normal, regular life routines and schedules. Uh, and one of the things that I want us to talk about as we go into this is talk about the subject of time itself. And, and so just on the subject of time, the, one of the interesting things about this is that we seem to be almost always, always, always conscious of the time, you know, and, and so the culture that we're in particularly, you're always either, you know, I've got my watch on here, and so, uh, you know, I can see exactly what time it is down to the second. Uh, if you're in the classroom, you have a, a clock on the wall, and you're watching it tick down until recess or PE or the next period. If you're at work, you're watching it until what? You're looking for when is it five o'clock, right? And so when is the quitting time coming? Maybe many of you look at it that way. Uh, in fact, one of the most common questions that we ask one another is, you got to help me out today. One of the most common questions that we ask one another is, what time is it? Okay, so just because I know that you watch your clocks even while I'm preaching, I, I know I see your head go down, you're looking at your, you're like, man, he's going long again. I'll be on time today, okay? And you can trust me with your time for the next few minutes. Uh, I even have a clock in the back of the room that tells me exactly how much time that I have left or what time I'm supposed to be done. And uh, they've told me that they're just going to cut my mic off if I run over on time. So we'll see how that goes today, all right? Uh, so one of the most common questions that we have is what time is it? And every once in a while, we get so inundated with life, we get so caught up. Maybe it's, hopefully, it's something that you really enjoy doing. Maybe it's something that's a hobby of yours, and you just kind of get lost in time. And we use phrases like, well, I just lost track of time. Time flies by when you're having fun, and all of the other cliches that we want to throw into the mix as we talk about time. But this being a very, very common question, there's a much more rare question that we should be asking. And today I want to ask that much better question. And so why don't you say it out loud with me? What am I doing with my time? Right? And, and so as we go through this today, I want us to be reminded, and this is going to sound morbid, and you're going to be glad you came to church today, that your time is running out. Your time is running out. And so our calendars that we have, I mean, I feel like we just rolled into 2018, and here we are pushing into the next school year, and they're pushing dates at me for 2019. And so our, our calendars track our weeks, and they track our months, and ultimately they track our years, and then we have these clocks that are tracking our hours, and then how many of you have a second hand on your watch? Anybody have a watch on with a second hand on it? So, okay, you guys participate with me already. Tick, 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 and you can kind of literally watch your life tick by. And so we all have an end date somewhere out there, and hopefully it's 150 million years from now, but that's not the reality, right? And so the older you get, the more you perceive this time flying you by, right? When you're young, let's just take the example of Christmas for a moment. When you're, when you're young and you're ready for Christmas morning, it seems like it's never going to get there. You're constantly anticipating and waiting and then when you get older, it's like, man, that's another birthday? Didn't I just turn 
didn't we just have Christmas? Are they already putting up the decorations again? And it just keeps coming and cycling. And there's actually scientific study that validates that idea that the older you get, it's actually perceived time moving faster. And the older we get, the wiser we get. See, when you're young, you perceive time is where everything is about you. The world centers around you. You're the center of your own universe. It's all about me. And when you get older, you begin to realize it's not quite that way, is it? And so time just continues to move. And so as we dive into this topic, as we consider time, as we ask this very, very important question, as we move into this new school year, this new season, I want us to look at one of the things that comes out of the book of Psalms. And oftentimes we think of Psalms, we think of David, who maybe was playing his harp and he was singing uh, the different Psalms that we have. But did you know that Moses actually wrote one of the Psalms? Did you know that? You, got you Bible folks, you guys know, know that? So let's look at one that... Moses wrote, and maybe you've heard this one before. This is in Psalm 90, and this is verse 12. And so can we read this together? You ready? One, two, three, read. So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Teach us to number our days. And so Moses, when he's first implying this idea, he's kind of talking about this same principle that we would have been as an adolescent, that at this point in time, I kind of feel like I'm invincible, that time is on my side. I've got all of the time in the world. And so when we have a surplus of something, when we don't uh, assign a value to something like our time, then we're more inclined, the propensity is, that we waste that time. Right? And so Moses is coming along and he says to teach us, meaning that we don't know by default, teach us to do what? To number our days, to make the most of them. Any of you who have been married, anybody married in the room? Any of you who have been married, uh, especially the ladies in this, and maybe for the men you were waiting on the honeymoon, but the ladies, you were counting down the days, the minutes you knew is like 26 days, 14 hours, 13 minutes, and 27 seconds, and he's going to be mine. I got him, roped him in, got him right there. And so somewhere inside there have been something that you've been planning for, that you've been anticipating, and so you are counting the days, you are numbering your days, and Moses would say, this would be the place of absolute wisdom. And so as we talk about this idea of numbering our days, I want to take us into a very practical illustration this morning. And maybe you've seen this illustration as I unfold it. This was actually a, something I saw a number of years ago in a business context, a leadership context, and it has been so, so valuable for me that I often think about this when I think about our time. And so if you've seen this before, it's going to be helpful for you today. If you haven't, man, this is a fantastic illustration. Let me grab some water. Okay. And so we have a few different jars, uh, a bucket and a couple different jars. And this jar here, this jar represents your capacity. It represents your time, any increment of your time. It could be an hour, a day, a week, a month, a year. It could be your entire life. And so let's just go for a moment and say this represents your life. This jar represents your life. And on the inside of this are a bunch of small pebbles. And so these pebbles represent in your life, they represent kind of the trivial, the less important. For some of you, like the majority of this jar is made up of Facebook, right? So <laughs> I'll let you roll yourself under the bus for that one. But it's made up of the things that they don't really matter, right? And so maybe it is Facebook. Maybe it's surfing the Internet. Maybe it's watching another cat video on YouTube. Uh, maybe it's shopping. I know that's a, a, a big hobby for some of us. Uh, maybe it's, it's something such as a, a sport or an activity. Maybe it's golf or hunting. Uh, any of you love to fish in the room? Where's, where's my man Chris at? There's another fisherman right there, Nathaniel in the back. And so inside of this, it could be made up of so many different things. Maybe it's that last season on Netflix that you've just been binging on. I mean, they always throw those cliffhangers in there. You can't get away from that last one. It's right. It's one more, and then I'm going to go to sleep. One more, and then I'm going to go to sleep. Right? And so this jar represents your life. These represent the things in your life that, you know what, there's nothing wrong with them in and of themselves. 
But at the end of our days, at the end of our life, when we're looking back, I can guarantee that none of us are going to say, I wish I had spent more time binging on Netflix or doing one of the other things or scrolling Facebook, etc. And so these represent the small, seemingly insignificant things in our lives. And then I have a bucket of rocks over on this side. And these rocks represent things in your life that are much more important. They're much more significant. There's a lot of value assigned to each one of these rocks. And so if this is your life, you have to make time. You have to make space. You got to have margin in your life. If, if you're married, a lot of you raised your hand just a moment ago. You better somewhere in there, in your life, have space for your significant other, right? And so they have to be able to fit on the inside here. And then, you know what else? You've got to have uh, in your life. You, 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 how many of you have kids? Any of you have kids? Okay. Yeah, our, our kids' ministry over here is exploding. I know that a lot of us have kids in the room, and uh, you guys took it to heart. Be fruitful and multiply. You're doing well. Pat yourself on the back. You're doing a good job with that, folks, okay? So if you have kids in your life, that's pretty significant, right? And, and so maybe in your life, you, you have a couple kids. You definitely got to get uh, both of those on the inside here. You got to have some room for those to fit on the inside. Uh, how many of you work a job? Any of you work a job out there? Okay. You don't work a job. All of you are unemployed. This is what my tax dollars are going to. Okay, great. Let's have a conversation afterwards. You can set up a counseling appointment. All right, here we go. So this one is representing your career. All right, and so we've got some ambitions in our career, uh, and so we want to be able to accomplish certain things. We have some goals in mind, where we want to be, uh, what we want to do. Uh, how many of you are in school? Anybody still in school? Okay, yep, I knew quite a few of you. Good morning. Good to see you. Uh, I know quite a few of you. Oh, look, a bird. That's how I feel, that's how I feel this morning. Uh, and I digress. All right, this one, my friends, represents your academics. Maybe you're still in school, you're still studying, and so we all have our own rocks that we're, we're trying to fit in here inside of our jar, and uh, here I've got a rock. Let's see, this one right here looks like it could be maybe your relationships. This is a, uh, uh, your, you can't put your mother-in-law's relationship over here, okay? Uh, this, this is your family dynamics. Maybe it's an extended family. You've got to get that one. Oh, goodness, I don't want to break something. All right, that one is in right there. Okay, we really do have to put the mother-in-law in there. I'm sorry, she's got to go in there. Uh, and then maybe uh, somewhere inside of you, how many of you go to the gym or have some form of exercise in your life? Maybe you do some push-ups in your home. Where are you? What are you guys doing? <laughs> My goodness. All right, we've got our sermon series mapped out for the rest of the year. Get off unemployment and welfare, and let's do some exercise. All right, we got to fit this in. Whether you want to or not, it's going in the jar. We're going to, I think I can fit this in the jar. Maybe I can get this in the jar. Uh, and then, um, you know, somewhere in here, we got to, we got to get some, you know, some, some community in there. I, I need to spend some time with maybe some of my friends who aren't just Facebook friends. Maybe, you know what else I got to do? I got to, there's going to be a problem here in a minute. Um, this one right here, this is going to be go to church, right? I got to get, I got to get some church in here. I need some Jesus in my life. Got to get some church. And, uh, you know, um, you know what? We'll just leave this one out, okay? This one didn't make the cut. And so some, some of these things just couldn't even make it. This is the this is what it looks like in our lives sometimes. And, and this oftentimes is honestly what it feels like. It feels like you're just full to the gills, as they say in the South. It, it just feels like you're about to overflow, like you're at capacity. In fact, there are things that you feel like you want to do, you need to make priority, you need to make, be responsible for in your life, but there's just no more room. If I get it, it's just going to come crashing down on the other side. And now what do we do? How do we manage this? What are we supposed to do inside of our lives? And we try to just cram it in there. And no matter how hard we try, every time we, we're like, okay, let me just substitute or maybe I can force it in, and something just falls off the plate. And we end up in these situations. And, and, and this ultimately comes down to this busy, fast-paced life that's just hustle, 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 
hustle, and yet it feels overwhelming. I can't catch up. I'm always behind. And on the inside of me grows this anxiety, and this in the back of my head, when I lay my head down on my pillow, I can't forget some of these things that I know I should be doing. I just can't get to it. And stuff is just spilling out everywhere. And at some point, we begin moving through seasons of our life, and maybe it was, you know, I, I went through the high school years or the college years, maybe it was the first few years of your marriage or the second 15, 20 years of marriage or your career, and somewhere, because this is the way that we've conducted our lives, we begin to look back and we begin to feel, what's the word? Regret. We begin to feel on the inside of us something, I wish I could go back. I wish I could do something different. I wish I hadn't been so busy. I wish I had made time for my marriage and invested in it in the early years. I wish I wasn't pursuing all of these other little pebbles down here in somewhere. I wish, how could I? And so what if you could? What if you could from this moment moving forward? We don't get to go back, and that's the unfortunate thing about time. But what if from this moment, moving forward, you could do something different? What if you could approach it from a different way? And so let's see what happens if we approach it differently. And so let me put this one back in here. Let's see what would happen here. Oh, there goes the mother-in-law. She is in there for sure. I love my mother-in-law. My wife is in the back of the room. <laughs> or else, yes. <laughs> yeah. and the jar won't be my only problem if that's the case. It's not the case. And so we begin putting them back in here. And these are the big things. These are the important things. And so by just reversing the order, now I can seemingly put them all in the bottom here. Oh, here's one that didn't even make the other cut that I can get back in here. And this was the career one right here. And here comes the, uh, wait, that was, well, I, I don't have time for this one. But now I, I think I can fit this one back in here. You know what? And this one was the education rock right here. And uh, so now let's see what we can do. And so if we just reverse the order, now these things are all taken care of, right? And so we have all of that. It's already done. It's taken care of. Those are my ultimate responsibilities that I have. But the beautiful thing about our life and about our capacity is when we simply reverse the order, when we change the order, something significant begins to happen. And I have to put the mic down for it. This glass broke on the way to do this illustration. So, uh, paramedics, be ready. Okay, here we go. Are you nervous? Yeah. All right. I'm a little nervous if I'm honest with you. So the, the reality is by reversing this, all of the priorities are taken care of. And these other little small pebbles weren't bad in, in and of themselves, but when they become the priority, when they take over everything else, when they're out of order, I mean, we put priorities in here that we never could have even gotten to because we did things out of order. And so by simply changing up the order that we put them in there, it makes all of the difference. And so here's the point of this, is that priority determines the capacity. And so if you felt like this was your life and it was just overflowing all the time, then I would challenge you at the core level of what you are prioritizing. Because priority, the order, determines our capacity. And the reality is, whether you've seen the illustration or not, this isn't a new concept. This isn't, okay, yeah, Pastor Daniel, I get it. We, got, we need to get our priorities in order. Okay, thanks. 
and uh, it will go on about our way. But if this is the case, and if this is not new to you, and you know that priorities are our utmost important, we got to get things in the right order, or everything feels like it's falling apart, then why don't we live this way? If we know that to be true, and you know it in your hearts, why don't we live that way? Well, let me, let me give you some of the reasons, okay? So here's some of the reasons that we don't put the big rocks in first. First of all is that culture prioritizes the trivial. See, in, in the culture and the influence that we have everywhere around us, it's constantly begging for your attention, and it's baiting you into prioritizing things that you never really signed up for. But we unconsciously or without thinking, we continue to just do what the rest of culture says that we should be doing. And ultimately, it leads to this feeling of I've got to do more, I've got to be more, and I'm busy, I'm busy, I'm busy, and we end up in this rat race. And we kind of force all of those things inside of it. And here's the point about this, about the culture, that if you don't decide for yourself Someone else will decide for you, and you'll spend the rest of your days feeling like you're constantly underwater, that you can't catch up, that things are simply falling apart. The second reason that we don't put the big rocks in first is that we prioritize the urgent over the important. Now because we've added things and we've packed things in there and some things that really shouldn't even been in our jar in our lives to begin with, now because we're so overflowing with those things and we've treated everything equally with equal priority, now everything is screaming at us. It's vying for our attention. Pay attention to me, pay attention to me, pay attention to me. And now everything that is urgent is screaming at us. And do you know what happens when the urgent is screaming at you? Do you know the very first thing that gets put on the back burner? Your relationships. Because your relationships don't have this urgent pressing on it, does it? Oh, you know what? I, you know, I, I want to play with you, but I, I can't today because I got I to. We, we can do that. To, look, how about we do that next week? Next summer, we're going to get around to going and doing that thing that we've talked about doing. And the reality is, because now we're prioritizing everything that's vying for our attention, that's screaming at us, it demands that we pay attention to it. Now we're in this position where we've neglected some of the things that are the most important to us, and more often than not, it's our relationships. See, intimacy, and I don't just mean the, you know, intimacy and busyness are in constant conflict, in in competition with one another. They don't go hand in hand. And oftentimes we have to choose. And you know this to be true, that in your busiest seasons of your life, you begin to feel a vacuum in your relationships. And so culture begins to say to us, prioritize the trivial. We begin to treat the urgent as equally important to everything else. And now... We are in this position where we look back and we miss the opportunities. And this is that place, and you know the stories, you know people have been there, and maybe you even have some of your own regrets when you look back, and man, oh man, if I could do it different. And, and so as I think about this, honestly, I was on vacation uh, a few weeks ago, and I, I've been feeling like God was speaking to me about some things, that maybe he wanted to do some more things in my heart and in my life and in my family, some of the ways that I wanted to disciple my children, some of the things I wanted to do here in the church. And honestly, I'm sitting there, and it began to feel overwhelming, and I'm thinking, God, how could I possibly do any more? Like, I feel like things are already falling apart. I'm, I'm trying to catch up on phone calls and this and that and relationships and all this other stuff. And I felt like the Lord began to whisper to me, it's, it, it's not by adding more things, it's by prioritizing things. And maybe, just maybe, there needs to be some addition by subtraction. And it ultimately is a position of priority. And so I'm sharing this with you because I need to hear it. And so... Uh, one of the things that when we go through is oftentimes we think the cure is just going to be how do we add more stuff to it? And so here, let's say it this way. It'll be on the screen. You become less busy and more productive by determining what's important and prioritizing around that by putting the big rocks in first. 
And so it's a simple idea. And so ultimately, we, we have to ask some questions. We need to have some identifiers. Well, first of all, we need to ask, well, what are my big rocks? You need to know what they are. And for each of us, they're slightly different. I, I would beg to say that we probably share a handful. But beyond that, there might be some ones that are different. And you need to know, what are my big rocks? And maybe the question is not what, but who are my big rocks? And you need to know this, and oftentimes we just move through without asking these questions. And so what would it look like for you? What would it mean to kind of change the order of, of having the small pebbles in first and reversing this and getting the big rocks in? What would that mean for you? What would that require of you? What would you have to change? What would you have to rearrange? What would your calendar look like? What would your weekly schedule look like? What might you have to tell work about that overtime? What would you have to do differently? And so if priority determines our capacity, this ultimately determines the fulfillment that we have at the end of our days and even in the moment to moment, the hour to hour, the day to day, to week to week. And did you happen to notice that we, we missed one of the rocks? There was actually, actually one of the rocks we didn't ever get in there. And, 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 and maybe for often... A lot of us miss this rock, and it just kind of sits over here, and we have the best intentions to get to it, but it seems like it should be prioritized, but there's just no space to get it done, and so if I had reversed this and done it the right way, it would have fit right here, okay? So let's talk about this for a moment, it, it, and this is where it kind of this is where the story just kind of forks for a little bit. And, and so maybe if, if you're in the room and you're a guest with us today and you're like, you know what, I've been to church, I've done the thing, but I'm, I'm not really a, like a, a believer, a Christian, then for you, it might just be, well, how do I prioritize my life? But for those of us that are believers, that are Christ followers, that say, yeah, I'm, I'm a Christian, count me in that group of people, we actually have a rock that was not mentioned here, but ultimately should have been the first one that went on the inside. And see, God becomes the biggest rock, and we're supposed to put him in first. Now, this is kind of cliche. You know this as a believer, but you also know what happens when life just continues to come and keeps going, and it gets busy, and the cycle repeats itself. So what does the Bible teach us? What does the Bible say to us? And so when we look inside of Scripture in our English Bible translated from Hebrew and Greek into our English, when you look and you start, if you were to do a keyword search or word study and you were to try to find this word like priority, you wouldn't find it in there anywhere. That word doesn't show up. But another word that kind of relates to it and implies a lot of concepts and ideas appears time and time and time again in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, and it's this word, seek. Seek. And so when we look at the Bible, one of the scriptures that I'd like to look at is Psalm 63, 1. And you'll see this idea played out over and over again. Now, this one is actually David. And David says to us, oh, God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you. And in a dry and weary land where there is no water. And so David, in this, in this position, he says, I earnestly seek you with all of my heart, with all of my efforts. Another place where David is writing, he says this to us, Psalm 119, 10, with my whole heart I do what? I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. And so throughout the scripture, we see more and more places that use and imply, and if I had the time, I would read several more, but they're gonna turn off my mic in a few minutes. And so you know one of the other most famous passages, one that talks about this idea of seeking. If, if you went to any kind of little uh, Bible school when you were, uh, or, uh, when you were a kid, um, Sunday school, that's the word I was looking for, you probably memorized this one. Jesus talks about this one. And so here it is in Matthew 6, 31. It says, therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? And now it seems like these things would be pretty significant. Maybe I should have, maybe we should have made some more room over there for our eat or our drink, or especially the wear when a lot of us put a lot of effort and energies into the what do we wear kind of rock. What does that fit on the inside? But Jesus is saying, listen, you don't even need to worry about those kind of things. And he goes on to say this. He says, for the Gentiles 
And Gentiles here, in other translations, you might see the word pagans. Pagans is simply people who are not living their lives, honoring God, and not necessarily believing in God at all. And he says, listen, the Gentiles or the pagans, what do they do? They seek after all these things, and yet here's what. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. He says, don't worry about these things. Don't be anxious about them. Don't let them consume you. So what if they're not fitting in here all the time? Your heavenly Father who knows you need them, he'll take responsibility for them in your life. And you've probably memorized this one. You've probably seen this one before. But here's the tension in that. Do you believe this? Like, really, not just like, oh, yeah, I should believe that. Like, do you believe it inside of your heart? Do you believe that God is good and that he knows you and he knows the needs that you have? And if your answer is indeed yes, then why sometimes do we get such anxiety about them? Why do we get concerned uh, about how to fit all of these other little things into our lives that we feel like we need? The Lord ultimately knows us. He knows our needs, and he will see that we have our needs met as we seek first, as we seek God. And so why would we not do this if we believe this? Why would we not constantly put him first? Matthew, continuing right here, the verse 33, it says, But seek first the kingdom of, his, of, of God and his righteousness. And so prioritizing, seeking first, making God the priority, putting God first inside of our lives, then that comes with a promise, right? And you know this promise. Here's where the promise comes. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. And this is where the most practical application of this seeking first, and this is very practical, is, is what does it look like for you when, when, when you're first rolling out of bed, whether that alarm clock goes off or whether you're just waking up on your own? What, where does your mind go? Where does your brain go? This is a pretty good test and indicator of whether we're seeking first. This is a practical exercise. And so maybe it's to reach over to the bedside and smash the alarm, and then after that it's to grab the phone and do some scrolling on the internet, social media. But when we take this at a practical level, if order determines our capacity, the priority in our lives, and if we are looking at this from seeking God first, what would it mean for us if we put him first in our day? Very, very practically, very practically. Now, I don't, I don't mean from like, you know, you got to, some of us are, are made different. We're wired different. And, and so, so some of you, you're like, what do you mean? I, I can't go to the restroom for, please do that, right? Some of you, you might need uh, to, to, to brush your teeth first or something like that, you know, feel like the Lord can smell the, some of you might need a cup of coffee. That's, that's not the point. It's like inside of our heart, the, the first thing. That's a good indicator of kind of where our thought process is, where our heart is. What does it go to immediately to work? And that's probably an indicator of where your priority sits. Is it that thing you've been concerned about, or is it your relationship with the Lord? Order determines your capacity. I love this quote uh, from Martin Luther. He says, pray and let God worry. It seems like a sen such a simple idea. But it, when you, when you kind of dig into this a little bit further and you find out about Martin Luther and he said, you know, it, it's not just as simple as praying and let God worry. The more things I have on my calendar, the more things I have on my schedule that compete for my time of prayer, it actually means that I either get up earlier or I find some other way because what he had figured out that is if you would put God first, then that determines what happens with everything else. And the reality is when we begin to say yes to God first thing in the morning, it puts us in a perspective, a mindset, a framework where we can say no to the other things that are just competing. They're just vying for our time, our energies, our affections. And so it positions our heart that way. It allows us to have a perspective where we worry less. You want some more time added back to your clock? Worry takes away your time at the end of your days. This is practical. You can live longer if you figure this out. If you get to that position where I'm not going to be so worried with everything, I'm going to trust God in that moment. You know another thing, and this is one of the lessons that I'm really learning right now, is sometimes I feel guilty at the end of my day 
when there's still those things that were on my to-do list. I'm a very task list guy. Sometimes I spend more time on my task list than I do actually getting the things done. And uh, so uh, sometimes at the end of the day, you've got things on your plate that are just like, oh, man, I didn't get to that today. I hope to get to that. I hope to get to that. And one of the things that I'm learning is that if I will put God first at the very beginning of it, some of the things that maybe I didn't get to, I, it gives me a peace that ultimately, God, I, I, today I give you my day. Today I give you my agenda. I've got this appointment at 2 o'clock today. Lord, I give it to you. Be in the middle of that. Very practically speaking, and at the end of it, I trust that I've done my best. I have a good work ethic. I've done everything I needed to do, and now I'm just going to trust that, you know what, it wasn't meant for me to do today. It also positions me because, I'm again, sometimes I can be very head down, grind it out. It also positions me to actually be present in some of the interruptions that do come. If we are Christians and Jesus lives within us, that he's actively speaking to us, there are some times when he's going to derail your appointments that you had and send you to an interruption that needs your attention, someone that needs to be prayed for, someone that needs to be loved on or cared for. And so by positioning myself at the very beginning of my day, it actually brings me to this position to say, you know what, God, I'm giving this to you. I give you my hands, I give you my mouth, I give you my feet. Very practically going through these, today I am yours. My schedule is yours. My agenda is yours. What would it look like in your life if you were to begin to do that? If we truly believe that priority determines our capacity, there are some other things that this communicates as well. Our order communicates the priority that we have. And this is somewhat related, but you can see this throughout Scripture. You can see the same idea, that the order that we put God, it communicates. It communicates to others around us, and it communicates to God himself. Maybe you remember this one. Remember this was out of Revelation chapter 2. You remember that, that Jesus, through this prophetic writing of John, these letters were written about these churches. This was written to one of the first end-time churches, and scholars, many of them would agree that, that we're kind of in that uh, category of end-time church. doesn't mean that it may or may not happen in our lifetime, but we're in that uh, category. And so they wrote these letters, and here's what it says in Revelation chapter 2, and he says, I know your deeds, and look at these deeds. These are good things, right? Watch this. I know your deeds. I know your hard work. I know your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and you have found them false. I know these things about you. I know that you are busy doing good things. There's nothing wrong in and of themselves for these things that are in your life, that are in your jar. I see that you're doing these things, but there's a problem with the way that you've done it and the way that you've structured your life. Here's the problem. And because of that, I hold this against you, that you have forsaken, go to the next slide, that you have forsaken your first love. He says, I see all of these other things that you've been doing, and, and some of them are even good works, but yet somewhere in your heart, you've gotten it out of order. And so today, I'm not telling you anything you probably don't know, but it's just a call, a reminder. What does it look like in your life? What order do you have them in? Is God second? Is he third? Is he somewhere down the list? Does he not even fit in the jar? And God does not like it, will not like it. In fact, he says, I'm, I would hold this against you, that I am to be your first love, that God being the priority, God being first, that determines the capacity and impacts everything else. In fact, that's the third and final thing I would say to you about this is that order impacts the rest. The order that we put things in, it impacts everything else. And this comes with a very powerful promise. Let me show you a couple places. Proverbs 3, 9 says this, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce, that all you produce, okay? And, and when we read this, oftentimes this is, this is coming from a position of, uh, he's talking about finances, but the principle applies to so many other areas as well. That first fruits, that first offering, that first piece of your day, when you're first waking up and drawing in that breath, God, today I want to live for you. I want to worship you. I adore you. 
He says this, here comes the promise, then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. They're in this position of overflowing to the point that you cannot contain it. And so I'm convinced that all of Scripture points out this idea that the order matters. And it even matters over the amount that God wants to know that we're putting him first, that he is the priority. And so I know there are times for me when, you know, again, the life just kind of, it, it, does it, it does its things. And then there's moments when I would say, yeah, man, I really get this one. I, I'm doing this well. And it feels like this. And that, that is a good feeling. But then there are times when it does feel like you just can't fit it in there, when I'm messing it up, when I've gotten things way out of order, where, where God has slidden down the line, or, or my wife, or my relationship with my kids, and, and sometimes they take a back seat to things that I'm into, or that are hobbies, they're not necessarily bad, or sometimes they take a back seat because of the demands of the urgent that's all around me. And so we probably don't ever always get this right. And today, as we move into the season of the back to school, uh, I think it's a good time for us to stop and to think and to press pause and to simply say, what are my priorities? Who are my priorities? Who are the big rocks? Do I have them in the correct order? Am I living my life that way? And you know this to be true. And here's the thing that I would say. The distance between the truth you know here and the truth that you live equals the pain that you experience. In the beginning, Moses said to us, teach us to number our days that we might have wisdom. Knowledge is the information here. Wisdom is knowing what to do with that knowledge, how to apply it to our lives. And when we don't have the wisdom on how to apply the numbering of our days, our greatest pains end up being regret, missed, spent time. Tick, 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 tick. As we go into this season, what if you were to put God first, really put him first? How would it change everything else for you? And what would your life look like? What would your family look like? What could this school year look like if God was first? Let's pray together. God, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you, Lord, that you are indeed a jealous God, that you are jealous for us, our affection and our attention. All throughout Scripture, you show us time and time again that you don't want anything placed above you in our lives. Father, would you forgive me for the places in my heart and my life where I've come up short on this? Even recently, God, when I've put things above you, would you forgive me? Uh, would you help me to press pause in the midst of all of the chaos and the crazy and reevaluate the priorities? Lord, I, I know that you have great potential for us as a church and as individuals and as families, but our capacity is determined by the priority and that if we would put you, the biggest of the rocks, and allow you to help us determine what the other priorities are for our lives, then not only would we be stewarding those things well, but you would bring abundance to the point where we couldn't contain it. And so God... We say together in our hearts, you are first. And we trust you in Jesus' name. If you're here in the room today with every head bowed and every eye closed still, if you're here in the room today and maybe you say, you know what, I, I've never, uh, I've been a part of churches, I've seen churches, I've heard Jesus talked about a hundred different times, but at this point, Jesus is not in my jar. The, the beautiful thing about the gospel and the scripture is it says that, that he would stand at the door and knock, but he would not force himself in. He doesn't force you to fit him into the jar. It becomes by invitation. And so he invites you to allow him to be the central rock that you build your life around. 
And if you haven't made that decision or you made it a long time ago and you want to come back to that place, then the invitation is for you. Simply saying, Jesus, you are my rock. I need you. I'm putting my trust in you. Help me to build my life around you. And if you'll pray that, the Bible says that he is faithful to save us from our sins, cleansing us from our sins, and to redeem us and invite us into relationship with him.